Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby. If you're a practitioner and want to learn the basics of SIBO, head over to SIBOtest.com and sign up as a practitioner. This will give you access to a free 90-minute webinar on the fundamentals of SIBO treatment. If you're a patient, please know this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor podcast. So, welcome SIBO practitioners. On the show with me today is SIBO and diabetes expert, Dr. Mona Morstein. She's a naturopathic physician and the author of the recently published Mastering Your Diabetes, which is um, really an incredible resource. I can't wait to read it. That um, I and many other practitioners, we've been waiting for this because Dr. Morstein has been uh, teaching us a lot about diabetes over the last years. And Dr. Morstein was a professor of gastroenterology at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona for 11 years before moving back into private practice and um, opening the Arizona Integrative Medical Solutions uh, Clinic. And about five years ago, she started to specialize in SIBO, and she has some unique approaches that I'm keen to speak to her about, as uh, she's also recently, um, as if the book writing and all that's not enough, and lecturing, but she's also developed a product line for SIBO with one of the U.S. companies, so really keen to get into that as well. And Mona and I frequently run into each other at various SIBO conferences when we're presenting or attending. And when I practiced in Billings, Montana, about 13 years ago, she had a practice in Great Falls, Montana. So we've peripherally known each other for about 20 years now, I think it is. So I'm really happy to have you on the show today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Narala. I I really welcome uh, being here. I don't mean to start off on the wrong foot, but just to clarify, the book is Master Your Diabetes. Oh, okay. Uh, just to, Thank just, you. Just, yeah, I'm, I apologize for that. No, that's good. So Master Your Diabetes, yeah. and you can get it on Amazon, I'm sure. Or it's elsewhere. actually now the number one selling book for type 2 diabetes on oh, Amazon. Oh, wow. So Congratulations. Exciting. Yeah, that's thanks. That's amazing. That didn't take very long, did it? No, it didn't. Uh, Maybe there aren't many other books. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, one of the things that I really love about our profession is that, um, you know, we have so much to offer in so many different areas. So I'm always so thrilled when I see one of my colleagues reach a level where we can impact so many more people. So that's so wonderful. And that's both in the field of SIBO and diabetes. And so I really want to dedicate this podcast to the topic of diabetes, blood sugar control, and so forth. So my, but my first question before we dive into that is how did you get into SIBO and why did it sort of strike a chord? Why did you want to specialize in this topic? Well, you know, when I, when I, I first did set up my practice as, as, as you stated in Great Falls, Montana, and over the years there, gastroenterology became a focus of my practice because I saw so many ranchers and farmers and they have well water and they've got cattle and they had so many parasites and so many gut problems that it just became a regular part of my practice. And I decided I loved working with the gut because naturopathic medicine, integrative care has so much value to healing up uh, gastrointestinal problems. And when I continued to teach it at SCNM, it, it just really verified to me uh, the need for physicians who are uh, capable at really helping patients reverse conditions. A SIBO, you know, I'm going to be honest. I honestly didn't like SIBO at first <laughs> because it was so overwhelmingly c- complicated. I mean, I think uh, aside from inflammatory bowel disease, SIBO is by far the most complicated uh, you know, condition. And for me, you know, this needing this step-by-step treatment and it was a little overwhelming, but when I started going to conferences and learning more and started kind of, you know, creating my own ways of looking at it and also again, seeing patients get better. And, and as you know, Nerala, cause you're so high above on the expert level. Um, these people have been sick for decades sometimes. And when we work with them and we start seeing them get better, it's so rewarding. Mm-hmm. And at this point, you know, for that very reason, I love 
working with SIBO patients because having learned so much from people like you and and Dr. Seibecker and and all the research coming out, I you know I really feel I have a fairly good grasp on it and and you do. Uh, you know, it's still complicated and it's still sometimes difficult, but it's exciting to see people get better. Yeah, that's definitely something that keeps us going and keeps uh, keeps me from, um, you know, basically wanting to learn more and more about um, microbiome issues and going deeper and deeper into methylation right. and all these different aspects that are sort of mind boggling. And I think we are uniquely positioned in, in a way as practitioners, because we are so able to um, sort of pick up on the nuances of the, of the condition, but also to adjust our treatments, because we have so many different tools in our tool bag that really can help patients in that particular state. Because no, I've never met two patients that have SIBO that are alike, that I'll do exactly the same thing. So it's really, um, it's really great time to be in the profession, I think. So... Can we talk about, you know, uh, diabetes is a well understood condition. Well, well, maybe that's arguable. Well. Maybe it's arguable, <laughs> but it's an under, well, it's understood I that, <laughs> yeah, no, maybe not. But it's, um, you know, the association between SIBO and diabetes is well established, meaning that it's an associated condition um, that has a high prevalence of SIBO or um, such, and similar to rosacea and similar to. Um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and these these conditions just tend to have a higher rate of SIBO uh, or incidence of SIBO. So, what? Why is that? What's going on here? Well, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, is it the SIBO is causing the condition, or does the condition set the person up for developing SIBO? And I think it goes both ways, depending on the condition you know what i'm talking about now Mm -hmm. with diabetes as i am you know as my understanding is that we're you know with people that are poorly controlled with diabetes which is in general a great amount of people with diabetes especially because people are considered well controlled by the ada if their a1c is seven you know Mm -hmm. and they're considered well controlled by the in America by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists if their A1C is 6.5, although the science says you're going to have damage to the human body when the A1C goes over 5.5. Mm. So, you know, so we're having most in America, you know, really uh, 75% of people have an A1C over 6 and almost 50% have it over seven. Wow. So when we're having these, well, that's because standard care is a high carb diet and medications. Mm-hmm. And that isn't an effective way to treat diabetes. So when we have these high levels, we get complications. And the complications with diabetes are due because glucose it enters four different cells in the body that can't produce insulin resistance. There's no way for the body cells to prevent this huge influx of sugar if it's high in the serum. And that's your eyes, your kidneys, the lining of your blood vessels, the endothelial lining, and and nerve cells. And so when we start developing uh, nerve damage, uh, generally people might feel it in their feet uh, or Uh, you know, sometimes we pick it up in the office physical exam and and they think their feet is fine and yet they can't feel this monofilament or that. And so when they're having, you know, it's not like we just get nerve damage in the feet. If it's happening in the feet, it's happening elsewhere in the body. And and a not uncommon place that it's going to happen is the autonomic nervous system, particularly in the gastrointestinal tract, particularly therefore causing hypomotility. Although, you know, honestly, diabetes neuropathy in the gut is interesting. It might cause diarrhea, hyper, but many times it causes hypomotility. And that's what we know is a etiological factor for developing SIBO. And um, so uh, this is uh, the connection that we understand that poorly controlled diabetes is a risk factor for developing SIBO. Mm. That makes a lot of sense, sort of this glycation of, of neurological tissue or nerves 
um, leading to potential issues with motility. So um, f- that begs the question for me, do you then, instead of the sort of standard prokinetics for SIBO, do you specialize your treatment to um, <coughs> to treat this, this sort of affected nerve tissue differently than you would uh, for somebody that has had post-infectious SIBO, for example? Do you know what I mean? Well, like, do so, you use different... Yeah. Do you actually use things like alpha lipoic acid or any of these other substances that we use for neur- neuropathy? Um, and do you get any? Do you get benefit from that? Do you see benefit with that? Well, it's very interesting. But my treatment of diabetes and neuropathy and diabetes, which is very reversible, you get the blood sugar under control and the body can heal. Uh, you know, damaged nerves. It was my working with diabetic neuropathy that made me think, why let's treat the damaged nerves in the SIBO patient. And so the same acetyl L carnitine has been studied in even uh, diabetes care, a, a sponsored medical journal by the ADA as of being of benefit in diabetic neuropathy and, and lion's mane. And yeah, alpha lipoic acid in a diabetic patient, I will always add that in because they always need it added in. So it's, you know, considering, uh, we might have damage from the autoimmune vinculin, but in a diabetic, even if they have that as a history, they certainly probably have some autonomic neuropathy and, and healing a nerve is healing a nerve. Uh, as I see it, wherever it is in the body, especially because at least in the diabetic patient, it's the same etiology, wherever mm-hmm. it is in the body. Mm-hmm. Do you like, I'm, I'm fascinated with lion's mane. I've been sort of experimenting a little bit with different conditions with lion, lion's mane. And I, first thought of that when I read about its, its powerful nerve regeneration capacity. So do you use that only in, in diabetic patients or is there some role for it potentially for regenerating the migrating motor complex when it's being affected by antivinculin antibodies and anti-CDTB antibodies? Uh, you- well, I always use it in SIBO patients, whether they have... Uh, it when when not obviously uh, when there's been that kind of damage. I mean, if it's an adhesion or uh, or some other anatomic aspect that's just preventing the mm-hmm. movement. But if there's been damage, all of my patients will get lion's mane, mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, it has to be a water extracted lion's mane. Uh, So not all, uh, you know, not all companies do a water extraction, but I learned that at um, uh, at a a mushroom seminar that I went to and in turn, you know, and I think it's uh, I don't think there's any other, you know, botanical that has such potential healing properties to the nerve. Then lion's mane uh, with its nerve growth factor aspect to it, right? So it's got this nerve growth factor that really um, has been shown to help heal uh, nerve cells. You know, this is, uh, it's kind of really exciting um, in terms of it, right? Uh, So... um, uh, there's even been studies showing this nerve growth factor aspect on uh, neuro n- neuron neuro, nerve cells. Mm. So I think it's pretty exciting uh, herb, and it's simple and it's easy. I mean, I only give one capsule twice a day, so it's not, you know, a crazy uh, product that overwhelms people. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, in that regard, I think it's a good product for for that reason in SIBO patients. Great, yeah, it's some, sometimes it's a bit challenging to know if, uh, you know, obviously what's working, if it's working, because sometimes you <laughs> don't know if the if nerves have actually been affected. And so stay, staying with sort of more standard prokinetic, prokinetics tends to be a little easier, but it is something that I am also um, experimenting with a lot. So. Oh, oh, I mean, I do want to mm-hmm. clarify, I am not using it as a prokinetic. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's being added to right. the pro kinetic. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, I, def- and- I completely agree with you with that 100%. So, and talking about prokinetics, it's like, you know, one of the things that I'm, uh, and I think we all as SIBO specialists or experts, we have our own niche and how we work and and how we develop our protocols. And so one thing that I look at for sure is like, obviously, those people that have a very (coughs) strong history of post-infectious um, IBS and or SIBO, they are going to get a lot more attention paid to prokinetics versus those that may just have adhesions where their migrating motor complex is fine. It's just that they have an outflow problem. So that's right. how we kind of tailor it a little bit yes. more, just more to clarify for the practitioners listening. Okay, that, so uh, yeah. um, another yeah. uh, another thought I had about diabetes in particular is, of course, the diet. And so we all know that um, at some form of low FODMAP diet, whether it's the uh, SIBO-specific food guide or the, uh, you know, my offset is sort of the biphasic diet. I'm sure you have something else similar. Um, that's a really great place to start with the diet. And then I sort of custom make it for each patient around that. But with diabetics, they tend to really be uh, needing a lot more fiber because, um, well, you can tell us why, but uh, there, that's a well-established thought is that fiber is really beneficial for diabetics. So how do you go around that? And do you add in fiber specifically for those patients? You know, it's a good question. I mean, the the diet I may use is kind of created a, like a five-step SCD diet, uh, you know, a little stricter, less strict, less strict, less strict, less strict, mm-hmm. et cetera, going on. Um, but in a diabetic patient, uh, I, you know, I do not believe that... Um, grains are are an, a valid food for them to eat and there are studies showing that you know a higher a little more protein and fats and no grains can negatively change the microbiome and decrease the bacteria that produce short chain fatty acids like butyrate and of course we all know that butyrate is so vital for colonic cell health and even in preventing colon cancer. So it's um, in a diabetic patient, uh, they do, you know, I usually have them go grain free, but then add in uh, fiber powders, right? So that they're taking a couple tablespoons a day of a good fiber powder to, and or, uh, you know, or and adding in potentially a probiotic to try to maintain their microbiome. In the SIBO patient, you know, generally what I'm going to do is to get through my diet, you know, through the most restrictive, generally to the diet is opening up the most, takes about a couple of months. I honestly, so I do use probiotics uh, with my SIBO patients. uh, And um, so I feel I'm starting off at least with that. And by the time that they're done with their diet, I am going to, you know, try to add in uh, a fiber powder and see if that's, you know, if they're able to get that into their gut, uh, that it's feeling good and it can handle it. So at that point, I'm feeling that uh, I'll be working uh, in a positive way to maintain their microbiome and especially in their colonic bacteria uh, and hopefully at that time, it's not going to gas and blow them up. So what type of fibers would you um, recommend to your, to your diabetic patients and to your SIBO patients? Well, you know, to the SIBO patients, um, I'm pretty good early on. Like, in a, my, you know, my diet is kind of this... Um, 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 uh, five phase, but in like the third phase, I'm happy if they try adding in quinoa or millet. And for me, the vast majority of patients are able to handle uh, the quinoa and millet. And so getting into um, uh, some fiber right then and there, if they just have SIBO, I wouldn't want that in my diabetic patients. Right now, my the, my two favorite fiber products right now, one is um, whole food fiber from Standard Process, 
uh, which is oat fiber and beet, rice bran, carrot, sweet potatoes, apple pectin. Uh, you know, that's my favorite one, and it's the one the patients love the most too. Uh, and uh, it's 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 pink because of the beet root, uh, and it tastes good, and they really get good bowel movements. There's another one called Paleo Fiber from Designs for Health uh, as well. Uh, those are the two that I try to include. Uh, into my patients and see if it's a it's a viable supplement for them to add in. Uh, and yeah. is the paleo fiber uh, <coughs> is that like a coconut fiber or uh, you know they love everything coconut the paleos. <laughs> I know I don't know where that came I don't know what that deal is. Uh. Uh, you know it's uh, I don't know where the whole coconut thing uh, you know got so out of control you know um, but no the paleo is actually just acacia and the guar gum and you know it's it's carrot it's not too different but I actually don't like it as I, I, I like the whole foods fiber a little bit better but this is a good fiber it but it doesn't have you know you're funny you're very funny uh, it's got you know psyllium and pectin and flax and prune and carrot and mm. and some other things I can't remember but uh, you know it's um, uh, um, so th you know those are kind of the two that I focus on right now. Mm. Generally, I think most patients can handle the fiber at the end of the diet when you know they're really starting to incorporate more foods and so forth. Mm. Well, one of the things that I've been focusing on from from the get go really is there. You know, that for me there was always a bit of a disconnect between just <coughs> saying, okay, well, this is SIBO. It has nothing to do with the large intestine. Which, yes, technically that's true, but it is one tube, and there are yeah. a lot of things we don't understand yet about the microbiome as it exists in the small intestine and the large intestine. We know those are different ecosystems and understand that. But um, I've been looking a lot at uh, microbiome restoration in the large intestine because, you know, we are specializing in, in gastrointestinal disorders and it doesn't just end at the ileocecal valve. So True. we yeah. have to think about that. And I do see a lot of, I had actually a patient um, a couple of months ago that I did a stool test with that had absolutely zero short chain fatty acids. I've never seen that before. Yeah. That was uh -huh. like a first, oh, wow. I mean, I've, I've seen it low <laughs> and stuff, but it, this was non-detectable. So wow. that was a first, and I completely changed her diet, actually from a SIBO diet to a vegan diet um, with lots right. of fibers and things like that. Yep. And, and so we're, you know, we're sort of working through it all because there there's so much that needs to be balanced and restored. And one of the fibers I use is hydrolyzed guar gum for lots of different yeah. reasons. But I'm interested uh -huh. in this acacia gum because I, I interviewed also Chris Shade from the uh, Quicksilver Labs, Dr. Chris Shade, who uses a lot of acacia gum for binding, actually, you know, as a binder for detoxification. So it's something that I am really interested in and um, in incorporating more of because we know that fiber is so necessary and it's being vilified in SIBO. And I'm always careful to tell my patients, like, it's only for a short time. The diet is not meant to be forever. So anyways, you just know, a little course, side the note. Other benefit, um, you know, of course, acacia is also well known to break down into short chain fatty acids. So it's a great, it, you know, that's a great boost, uh, you know, for the coal. And I, I agree. It's very common. Uh, you're so right that, you know, when the small intestine is off, it's very likely, you know, the large intestine is going to have not enough beneficial bacteria or maybe an overgrowth of yeast or maybe some fatty acid probably, you know, it, 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 it's, it's uncommon. It's not rare, but I mean, I guess a person could have a, a, a really screwed up small gut and a completely healthy large gut. But I, I think I agree completely with you that that large gut needs to really be looked at as well because it's probably going to be suffering a little bit in some way uh, with a, with right above it you know, a big SIBO gut. Mm, mm. Um, so what, do you have any sort of specific protocols that you, that you customize for your diabetics uh, when they have SIBO? Is there anything that you do differently? Or why don't you just tell us what you what your approach is to treating diabetics with SIBO? Well, I mean, 
you know, diabetes is its own, uh, you know, is its own aspect of, uh, you know, as, as we say in my, um, low carb diabetes association nonprofit, you know, we have these eight essentials, you know, which is diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, healing the gut and the microbiome, environmental detoxification, which is so huge and so necessary, uh, probably for everybody, but at least for sure for diabetic patients, and then supplementation. So kind of got to deal with the diabetes. Uh, when he's, You know, the, the innate SIBO diet starts off, you know, of course, is a, you know, tends to be uh, – you know, it's a, it's, it's a match of, it's low, it, it's kind of low carb, but it's not totally low carb. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, if we're talking about sweeteners, we would only want the person with diabetes to use the straight stevia and not the honey, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't really want them drinking a bunch of grape juice and apple cider and eating a bunch of applesauce or, or, or things like that. So it's a little more almost, uh, you know, it, it's more protein and, and the vegetables until you know, we get to the nuts. And then like with anything else, using the nuts to make nut breads and nut, you know, nut muffins and nut pancakes and, you know, get kind of these pseudo grains in their diet, uh, that for many people are okay with SIBO and certainly are okay with diabetes. So kind of just try to, uh, you know, build it up uh, from there uh, and use those to uh, open up their diet in, in, in positive ways. Uh, it, but it can't, you know, and the other thing is, you know, getting in the protein powders, making smoothies and just trying to have them uh, get it, making sure they get books. And so I always have patients get some books so they have recipes because uh, that makes life better when you're actually making tasty recipes and not just eating what I say, unit food, you know, your chicken breast, your broccoli. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, people uh, get just, you know, they, that drives them crazy after a while. Um, so it's, you know, it just the, the biggest concern is the restrictive diet, right? Uh, and just making sure they've got enough to eat and they feel they've got enough and then can get good variety in. Then you've got to match the supplements. Although I don't need too many supplements for diabetes. You know, I mainly just use a multiple and a fish oil and I have a specialty diabetes product called Diamin. So then the other thing is just having to do all the treatment, the eradication of the SIBO. And then of course, healing up the gut part of SIBO. So it's a bit of a supplement, you know, kind of craziness uh, a little bit. But, uh, you know, the worst is over in a few months and, and that's helpful. Mm. So it's, it's sort of not too dissimilar. It's not like you have a completely different protocol for diabetics. You just add a couple more stages or, or products. Um, okay, so can you tell us, actually, though, yeah. in, in Australia, I don't think we can get this product, um, but I know about your product, Diamond. Um, do you want to just have a, spend a minute on telling us what that is? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, again, Priority One has been kind to me. Um, they, you know, they agreed to um, produce what I feel, which is why I made it. You know, I think the most comprehensive uh, product for diabetes, because as you know, Nerala, there's a lot of products out there where, you know, the term is window dressing. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's got this and that in there. But the therapeutic doses are ridiculous. They don't have anything to, oh, you know what, this product has 300 micrograms of lutein. Well, except the therapeutic dose is 10 to 20 milligrams, you know. So um, I wanted to create a product. I mean, yeah, the maximum dose is six, seven pills a day. But it's got therapeutic doses of gymnema, you know, of NAC, of alpha lipoic acid, of benfotiamine you know, of grapeseed extract, of, 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 of bilberry, so that, you know, in this one product, they're getting such a broad, comprehensive uh, product that helps reduce their cravings for sweets, helps reduce their insulin resistance, very good antioxidants, since 
you know, diabetic damage is all oxidative damage uh, in different areas of their body. So I, 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 may, I, I just made this product, uh, you know, that is so comprehensive. They can just take this and to cover all the needs that they have. It sounds like it could be useful for not just diabetes, but uh, several oxidative states, I think. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the benfotiamine? Because it's not something, I mean, I myself know about it, but just for the listener, can you explain benfotiamine? Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of practitioners don't know about it. Yeah. Now, I actually, the first thing I want to say about benfotiamine is I have no idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> I honestly don't understand. I don't know if it's pronounced benfotiamine or tiamine. I honestly have no idea. But um, that's the way it's spelled. And that's the way I <laughs> that's say it. tomato, tomato. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, so benfotiamine is a really interesting, it's a fat soluble thiamine. And we usually think that, oh, you know, all the water solubles are absorbed better than fat solubles. But actually, benfotiamine is actually really well absorbed, even better. And where it works, benfotiamine works to interfere with what you just said earlier, glycosylation, right? So glycosylation has these enzymes that enable the sugar to to latch onto the protein and cause this nasty mallard reaction in our body. And the benfotiamine really interferes with the enzymes and prevents that from happening. And there are some very good studies where benfotiamine has been used for people who have retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, uh, not so much the endothelial lining, but the other three uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, diabetic complications. And it's really been shown to have very positive, uh, benefits. Uh, the maximum dose a day is, uh, 450, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 450, uh, milligrams. Um, so it's really, um, it, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's also been shown in studies, uh, to prevent, uh, damage in high glucose um, areas. So, you know, it's not just that, oh, I don't have neuropathy. Why should I take benfotiamine? Why well, don't have neuropathy? It's also protective in these regards. So it's a really nifty uh, nutrient uh, that is underused, I think, uh, is, with some people for protection and treatment of complications. Mm. Sounds like a very, very useful product for sure. It's called, so just to reiterate, it's called Diamond for those of you uh, listeners that are, uh, can get this product and it's by Priority One, uh, an excellent U.S. company. Um, okay, so talking about blood sugar control, because it's not, you know, like, <coughs> it's not just diabetics that, that have issues with um, dysglycemia. Um, well, I, I, I do see in my patients sort of the, uh, the other side of the spectrum um, in terms of hypoglycemia and just poor blood sugar control um, and sugar cravings and so forth. And especially, not not always, but sometimes when I change their diet, it, these symptoms all improve because we know p protein and, and its effect on blood sugar. That's um, for, from a hypoglycemic standpoint. But can you give us some idea as to how you um, or just some, some tips as to manage hypoglycemia in those patients that are not necessarily diabetic, uh, but have pr uh, problems with hypoglycemia. Yeah, like sometimes like your reactive hypoglycemics, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so the way I look at reactive hypoglycemia, you know, uh, in between meals, you know, getting low, uh, cranky, uh, et cetera, you know, obviously we know the liver produces glucose in between meals and actually the kidneys. And we forget that the kidneys are uh, produce quite a lot of glucose. But let's say we'll, we'll focus with the, the liver. And the liver does that once it gets signals from glucagon in the pancreas and cortisol from the adrenals. Glucagon, uh, the alpha cells are pretty hardy. And it's very hard to whack those out. But it's pretty easy to get into low adrenals. 
and uh, burn those out. I mean, that's pretty much everybody in, a, in the world probably has that happen at some point in their life. So one of the things is really focusing on strengthening the liver, focusing on strengthening the adrenals. And of course, one of the best ways to strengthen the adrenals is doing just what you said, eating high protein. So the blood sugar is more stable and that gives the adrenals a rest so they can recover. Uh, there are certainly nutrients, I mean, the same nutrients like chromium, like zinc, uh, even the same herb like um, uh, gymnema sylvester, and then liver herbs, you know, just to make the liver, not to heal it so much, but just to help it function better uh, or uh, is very helpful. Some adrenal gland, you know, some adrenal adaptogens. If we look at this sort of a focus, um, you can really help people recover uh, very well. My favorite product for like the reactive hypoglycemic people is glycokinetic complex from ITI. Uh, do you, you know ITI? Yeah. Oh, well, of course they make the, yeah, we all know that they make the elemental diet. Um, they, so this is a product that uh, I, I, I don't use with diabetic patients, but I find it really helpful because it has in it a little pancreatic and adrenal glandular. It has got liver herbs. It's got blood sugar. It's got like everything that the people that have this weakness need to strengthen the main organs involved. Mm. Is there some element of uh, toxicity that can also be, Uh, drive this? I'm just thinking of some patients in particular that just have, uh, you know, we're working with their liver, we're working with their adrenals, and and uh, it's and we're looking at food addiction, etc. And and it's like it's not really um, overcoming this intense craving for carbs. So it's just an interesting. Maybe I'm just sort of micro uh, looking right now, and I and, and we should broaden the conversation. But it's it's just an interesting thought because that was where I was going next with these patients. Is that there are so many hidden aspects to blood right. sugar control, um, and and it's not. I'm not even sure it has anything to do with with whether their blood sugars are low. You know, right. that, that, mean, that, those cravings. Hmm? Certainly, emotional eating. Uh, you know, when, you know, it's all coming from uh, the mind and the emotionals, I know that can be a real problem for, do you see that then, you know, maybe that's an aspect for some of these patients? Yeah. Um, yeah. So th those are the ones that um, are, you know, we, we manage that through referring to um, counselors or something like yes. that, but I'm thinking right. more yeah. those that are where I feel like that's not an underlying issue. But anyways, I think that's yeah. that's maybe just isolated cases here and there, and maybe less useful to talk about. But I just always in the back of my mind, you know, is always this looming tip of the iceberg <laughs> of toxicity <laughs> that we have well, to deal uh, with. You know yeah. what Walter Crinian, uh, you know, says mm. about environmental toxicity it's pretty much if you eat drink or breathe you're toxic so <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh that that's his you know summary of could someone be environmentally toxic he's like do they eat drink and breathe so yeah. very good point <laughs> very very good point um well speaking of products uh i wanted to kind of talk about berberine which is one of our of course most used uh, yes. uh, substances that we use particularly for hydrogen dominant SIBO uh, and berberine of course is is the um, con active constituent in berberine containing plants like golden seal and, and coptis chinensis and organ grape and so forth but it also has been shown to have a wonderful um, effect f or wonderful be of wonderful benefit to people with metabolic syndrome. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, there was an infamous, uh, not infamous, a famous test, uh, probably going back a decade, where researchers compared berberine, you know, at 1,500 milligrams a day with metformin uh, at 1,500 milligrams a day and found that the berberine was equivalent to the metformin in benefiting diabetic patients and helping to control their blood sugar. Uh, so, uh, you know, we understand where uh, berberine is coming from. It, it stimulates in the body, that, uh, not to get too technical, but this adenosine monophos what if monophosphate, some, I get it, activated, mm. it's protein kinase kind of C. So this protein kinase C activation 
it, it can be turned off by you're too overweight, you have fat, you have too much glucose, uh, you know, there's your, um, you're not extra, you know, you're overweight. And so berberine kicks this in and this aspect reduces insulin resistance, promotes energy use. And so it's a, it's a huge benefit as well as, um, being anti-inflammatory as well as, you know, supporting the liver and, um, its health and its liver, the bile functioning and so forth, which also of course is needed with detoxification. So, you know, it's got, it also helps reduce cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, and so when none of, none of those things that metformin does. So it's really, uh, such a great combo product for people with SIBO and people with diabetes. And there's plenty of berberine. There's a thousand milligrams in the diamond product. So, uh, you know, it, it, we just couldn't leave it out, but, uh, such a huge benefit. Mm. So, and <clears throat> do you ever see problems, uh, with anxiety with, uh, berberine? Do you, I mean, I've seen a few cases of that, but, really? um, oh. yeah, because it apparently, uh, affects monoamine oxidase. And so those people that have these particular SNPs, um, and I've seen it a couple of times where it, it huh. was definitely the berberine and we stopped the berberine and it improved. Um, so, you know, so it does, it does have some side effects beyond its very, <coughs> very common, um, issue around nausea because it's such a, uh, right. um, you know, a the tannin, what is it? The tannins that, that actually cause the, the, or the, um, um, this sort of astringent effect on the mucosa that is um, can yes. be quite strong in some people that does fade after some time. But yeah, so the, okay, so you don't see it that often. The um, anxiety. I actually, uh, it's not. I, I personally, I've never seen the anxiety from berberine. Uh, okay, I'll keep an eye know. on it, mm. but I honestly have never seen that. Good to know. Okay, um, so sort of going back into. Uh, microbiome because we all you know it's just a bit total buzzword these days <laughs> you know everybody <laughs> everybody wants to learn more about the micro microbiome and I have really this whole path like 2017 I've just really dove a lot deeper into it um, and we're we're really on the cutting edge in many ways there's a lot of opinions we don't really know yet um, all of the different species of bacteria and exactly their role and and you know one of the biggest things that I look at too are the complicated um, interplay of different bacteria and hydrogen metabolism, that's enough to just basically keep you busy for a couple of years. But so my question, particularly around diabetes, um, as there is a lot more research coming out and what does what role does the microbiome play in terms of SIBO or LIBO, large intestinal bacterial overgrowth and dysbiotic state and what role do they play in the development of diabetes? Well, uh, you know, there's a, it's interesting, but there's a huge correlation, uh, to the microbiome, both of type one diabetes for sure. And type two diabetes. In fact, they've measured, uh, children who start having autoimmune antibodies uh, for diabetes, they, have already, they can measure that they are not producing, they don't have enough bacteria that produces butyrate. Uh, they have intestinal permeability. They have gut inflammation. Uh, you know, and these changes can happen even years before they clinically develop type 1 diabetes. So it's... Um, it's uh, really exciting if we could, you know, pick this up early, maybe, and we work really strong on the gut. Could we prevent pe kids or people from developing, you know, type 1 diabetes? So, we, it, it, very exciting. In type 2 diabetes, yeah, I mean, there's a number of problems with type 2 diabetes. And, you know, the, the microbiome, as you say, when it gets it, 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 for example, the microbiome decides or helps to decide how much nutrients you get from your food. And it can decide when you eat this food, you're going to get 100% of the nutrients and now you're going to get fat. 
Or I can decide, you know what, we don't really need that much. We're just going to take in 20% and the rest we're good to go. We don't need it. Uh, like your gut can decide how much iron it needs to take in in a day, right? Um, we do also know the biggest thing I think with the type 2 microbiome is that when it's out of whack and it's producing, uh, it can produce tumor necrosis factor. It can produce uh, intestinal inflammatory cytokines and the the of course and intestinal uh, endotoxins that get right through the gut and go to the cells and make them insulin resistant. Mm. Uh, and so we can see that a lot of this gut inflammation is having systemic effect on how the on, on the body and its ability to process insulin and glucose. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, to read and we just have to work on the gut as well as other aspects with the, with these patients. Isn't that the most gratifying thing? I mean, since, you know, we've been doing this a long time, you certainly longer than me, um, and I've been at it for 20 years. So it's the most gratifying thing to have this all come around to, it all comes down to the gut, <laughs> like what we've been talking I know, about I know. from for a very long time and what our elders naturopathic elders have preached for a long time so it's wonderful to see it come full circle and uh, we just uh, knowingly nod when we hear these types of things so it's wonderful um, let's get back to the products that you developed for um, for SIBO what are you well, you know yes, what do they I contain had, um, and how did that come yes. about well you know it was um I think um, most, a lot of companies now are realizing that uh, SIBO is one, a totally valid condition that two, affects many, many, many people and is three, getting a lot of, thank God, you know, attention so people can finally be treated. And so priority one uh, contacted me and um, asked if I would work with them to create some SIBO specific supplements and um, so that they could have a place because they really wanted to have an important part in helping people heal. And we created um, four different products. One is um, SIBO MMC, which is a, uh, a, a SIBO uh, prokinetic product. Uh, and we created SIBOitic. Kind of a bizarre one, but that's a natural. So that's a, a, a. So what I wanted was like one product that was a that was high enough in dosing that could be used to treat uh, the SIBO eradication in like one product that had garlic in it, really high. That had berberine in it. That had neem in it. That had you know these products mm. in. So we could just use. So we created that product. We created an enzyme specific for SIBO patients, and we created SIBO, uh, and that's called um, SIB, what is that called? Uh, uh, SIBO, SIBOzymes. And then the last one is SIBO Rebuild, which is to a, a product to help rebuild, you know, uh, the leaky gut, the nerves, and to treat the, the, the recovery phase of the small intestine once the SIBO has been eradicated. Sounds great. Um, what's the what's the SIBO MMC got in it? Well, the SIBO MMC has um, it has some uh, it has some ginger, it has some 5-HTP, it has some acetyl L carnitine, it has prickly ash, it has jujube, which are these are um, uh, Asian herbs that have been shown to produce motility in studies that they've done um, in uh, in Asian countries, and so um, so um, they were very interested in including those, having it be a unique to that particular product, since other people haven't really been using those um, uh, in an herbal you know type of product for motility. So it doesn't have any. Um of the lion's mane in it? No, uh, okay. but that is in the that is in the rebuild product. Uh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. That yeah, makes so sense. water yeah. extraction, and mm -hmm. it is very clearly water extraction, is in the rebuild product. 
That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, I use uh, xanthoxylum or prickly ash for those with um, dry mouth <coughs> syndrome. And yeah. just uh, like one or two drops um, for those or, or with Sjogren's or any of that. So it's interesting that it has this ability to like increase saliva, but it also um, is a motility agent. I didn't know that. That's really great. Good to know. Because uh, that would be something to perhaps include in, you know, like I, I have just been so underwhelmed with Iberogas. I still use it uh, uh, because yeah. as just a safety measure, <laughs> there's a few things that we sort of, you know, that I think we all use because we just, or, we, or some of us use because we just don't have much anything better. Although I do make my own bitters um, and sometimes I do that, but I do a lot of telemedicine um, and Skyping and things like that. So it's, it's just easier to get a product like that where you don't formulate it yourself. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's been the tricky bit. But, uh, you know, that's... Uh, what, where was I going with that? I forgot. I <laughs> lost my train of thought. But, the yeah, so the... Oh, the other thing was NAC for biofilm busting. You know, for me, it's like... Right. It's like, okay, we know it's okay. It's, it's good for H. pylori. There's studies around that. But do we really know... Does it really affect anything else? So those are the two things that we, I think we all sort of do because we don't have anything else um, that replaces them uh, very well. And especially here in Australia, right? So, but I am working on ah. that. I'm working on that a little bit. I'm, anyways, that's that's a, a, an aside. But oh, great! Good for you. <laughs> well, well, it's 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 long. Uh, you know, it takes a long time to to develop these things, as you know, right? You know that it. Uh, product development is takes a long time. Okay, excellent. Now we have only a few minutes left on this show, so I thought that we could end with um, what are your top three tips, or I don't know, three or two or one <laughs> or five uh, of of tips that you, of for, to practitioners or what what have you found particularly useful in your clinic? Um, or pearls of wisdom when it comes to SIBO or SIBO and diabetes, um, but anything like that would be really great. Well, I'll tell you what, one of my pearls of wisdom, I like, um, I like kind of analogies with patients, and I think when we do this, it brings things into light. And my, one of my best analogies that I do with almost every SIBO patient is to say, look, here's the deal. If you broke your leg you, you know, you would know it, it hurts, they put it in a cast, and if they put it on a cast on Tuesday, you're not calling the doctor's office on Wednesday saying, can I walk? Can I go walking? <laughs> you know, because you mm. can see this cast, on, and you know it's going to take eight weeks to heal the leg, and then you may need a month of PT. Mm. And so, it's, you know, so we have to understand that we don't see a broken gut because it's inside. But when you break your gut... You've just got to realize it takes the same, you know, two or three months to heal it that it does for any other broken part of your body that you would naturally understand takes that amount of time. And when I put it in this kind of picture for them, they really get it. And mm. I think that there's a problem with the gut that people just think, uh, I don't understand. It's been two days. It's been a week. Why aren't I feeling better? I'm like, because you broke it. It's still in a cast, <laughs> you know? And mm. so when I started doing that with patients, they really get, you know, they, they're much, you know, they understand the patients that they need to do it step by step. And, you know, so that I think was a really helpful way for me to talk with patients and uh, to get them to see that. Um, I do think... You know, I, my, you know, the way I do it, uh, you know, I am I very clearly separate the eradication part from the healing the gut part. It's the way I put it together. And, you know, there's for me just taking care of the one and having it be done and then starting the second part and focusing on that. Uh, for me, and I believe with my patients, 
it just seems to keep it clear and neat and tidy and a little less complicated, at least for me. And if I'm confused and it's complicated, that, you know, doesn't spill out well for the patient. <laughs> so I try not to get confused because that always is a better way. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And I think, well, this is, this is one of the wonderful things about like, you know, cause I think you and I have very, very uh, similar, I mean, approaches, obviously, right. but where we differ is that I, in, in the biphasic approach, we sort of do the healing a little bit first. <coughs> It's not all of it, but just to kind of get, decrease inflammation and you do it at the end. And yet we both get really good results, you know? Right. So and this right. is always a, right. the wonderful thing of like... <laughs> We know what we're doing. We do it a little differently, but, uh, you know, and we do customize our approaches to each patient. So that's, uh, but that's really very true. But I think, you know, part of that also shows um, some, con when you approach the condition with some confidence, you know, I think that transfers through to patients and it probably, you know, maybe doesn't matter really if it's your excellent biphasic or my step by step, but just the fact that they feel they're with someone who understands the condition and has resources to help them heal. Right. Mm. And, and, and maybe the nickel dime of how we do it isn't as important as them finally having someone who knows how to treat it, even if it's a little different doc to doc. That's very true. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank you for your time. It's been wonderful talking to you and um, probably have you on the show again in, in, little, in a little while further down the track. And yeah, just wonderful to touch base and connect and have you on the show. Th thanks so much. No, thank you. You're terrific. What a great interviewer. You're a great <laughs> podcaster. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Why well, do go on, Mona? Do. Yes. <laughs> no, I, so I do want to let me just because my publisher will be mad if I don't oh, just yes. end saying, you know, you can get uh, Master Your Diabetes by Dr. Mona Morstein uh, on, uh, on any Amazon, I imagine, mm -hmm. at least in Europe and America. Uh, so um, thank you very much for letting me, you know, promote that. Well, and it'll be all in the show notes, including where to contact Dr. Mona Morstein if you are oh. a patient. They'll all be in the, um, if you go to the SIBODoctor.com, um, we have transcripts and uh, talking points and products that she's talked about uh, and things like that all listed there. So um, wonderful. Excellent. Thank so <laughs> we'll talk again, I'm sure, Mona. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor Podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Head over to our sponsor, SIBOtest.com, an online testing service for your patients and home of the Practitioner Education Portal. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Thanks again for listening.